Okay, this video is going to be about the assessment of the liver failure patient and then the pathophysiologic basis for why they appear the way they do. Well, first of all, it's not just Lennox cirrhosis or alcoholic cirrhosis that causes it. There's un other underlying reasons that we often don't associate with cirrhosis, but things like cardiac cirrhosis, so secondary to right heart failure, applying a pressure to that organ and ultimately it, it failing. Biliary cirrhosis, secondary to problems with the gallbladder and gallstones. Viral cirrhosis, secondary to the hepatitis. So that's just um, other reasons. So let's talk about something called portal hypertension. So the liver receives blood supply from the portal system, which is that toxin-filled system because it's the blood supply from the colon. When there's liver cirrhosis, what's gonna happen is that because in cirrhosis, basically fibrous tissue is laid down instead of nice viable tissue to receive that blood. So therefore the blood from that portal system is gonna meet resistance. So that resistance is going to result in increased pressure in that system and it's called portal hypertension. Don't get it confused with systemic arterial hypertension, meaning high blood pressure. It is high pressure, but it's high pressure in this portal vein. So when that high pressure occurs, it causes blood to be forced back up into the surrounding circulation, and that surrounding circulation is shared with these esophageal vessels, thereby causing what's called bleeding esophageal varices. So that is one of the life-threatening emergencies associated with cirrhosis. And it bleeds going down into the colon, and it is a protein. So we're going to talk about that when we talk about protein in the gut. So just keep in mind that these bleeding varices are indeed going to be absorbed as a protein in the gut. Another thing that happens with portal hypertension is that the blood backs up into the surrounding circulation, the spleen. And what happens then is that the spleen then gets enlarged, called splenomegaly, or enlarged spleen, and it is overactive, therefore removing more platelets from the circulation than it normally would. So that is one of the three reasons why patients that have liver cirrhosis have a high risk for bleeding, because they have thrombocytopenia because of the splenomegaly that occurs. Another problem and another sequelae of this portal hypertension is that the large plasma proteins are not able to fit through like, let's say, the red blood cells are because of the portal hypertension. And therefore, the larger colloidal proteins are left to kind of seep down and fall into this peritoneal space where the fluid is going to accumulate, causing what we call to be ascites. So ascites is the accumulation of fluid in the peritoneal space. Now, this is a lot of weight, and if it's uncontrolled and unaddressed, it continues to build up, applying pressure to that patient's diaphragm. So difficulty breathing and dyspnea is certainly going to prompt hospitalization into the acute care facility. So that's the second reason. Now two out of the three re, um, things that occur secondary to portal hypertension will cause patients to be admitted into acute care. So the first one is esophageal varices and the second one being ascites. So let's talk about another function of the liver and then talk about what happens when that function goes awry. The liver is responsible to manufacture plasma proteins, plasma proteins like albumin, prothrombin, fibrinogen. So when the liver fails, it is not able to manufacture, make albumin, that plasma protein with the pulling power for water, that plasma protein that helps maintain intravascular volume and keep pressure in the vascular space. So patients with liver failure suffer from what's called hypoalbuminemia, and therefore, the periphery, the lower extremities, have that fluid that is going to seep out of the vascular space and into the tissue. So pretty severe bilateral lower extremity edema, secondary to hypoalbuminemia. And also, the patient is going to be low in albumin because some of it is now settling into the peritoneal space, 
causing the societies, and because it's albumin, even more fluid is pulled into that peritoneal cavity. Now the other two plasma proteins manufactured by the liver are prothrombin and fibrinogen. So you recognize these as the plasma proteins responsible for the patient's normal clotting process. Well, when we're deficient in prothrombin, we're going to have an elevated PTINR. So low prothrombin makes an abnormally high or elevated PTINR, and now that's the second reason why patients who are in liver failure are high risk for bleeding. Plus, they are bleeding from their esophageal vessels being engorged and then rupture, and it makes it even easier for that to occur. So normally, bilirubin, which is a product of the breakdown of old red blood cells, travels to the liver in this unconjugated form, also called this indirect form, also called this protein-bound form. And in the liver, it goes through this called conjugation process. So bilirubin is conjugated or made into this water-soluble form so it can pass over the hepatocyte in order to make bile. So then after the liver has made this bile from the breakdown of the old bilirubin, now it's in a conjugated form. Now it's called direct bilirubin or conjugated bilirubin. So what is the relevance here? When our liver fails and it's not up to the task of conjugating that bilirubin, then what you're gonna have is bilirubin before it goes through the conjugation process leaking into the system and therefore being absorbed by the tissues, therefore being excreted by the skin, the largest excretory organ in the body. So how does the patient present? Jaundice. Now I didn't have a yellow marker, but we'll make it jaundice. Make him look jaundice. So jaundice is a result of that pigment, which is bilirubin. Now because it's in the tissues, it's gonna go through and uh, pigment our urine. So, because that's going to receive that blood supply through the renal artery and anything in the system is going to go through the, the renal system. And therefore what you have is very pigmented urine. So the urine isn't going to be a yellow color anymore. It's going to be dark tea colored urine. So I made dark tea colored urine for you to see that. Uh, another problem is that because, or another manifestation is that because it is now not being secreted into the duodenum, now what we have are stools that don't have that pigment bilirubin. So our stool is now going to be lighter than normal. They call it clay colored stools. It's almost like a gray, so a gray clay colored stool. So what's pigmented is our skin and our urine, not our stool as what's normal physiology. So back to why that conjugation process has relevance. When we go to do a, a lab draw, and we wanna see which labs are elevated or abnormal in the liver failure patient, we'll see that the unconjugated or indirect bilirubin level is elevated because it didn't go through the process of conjugation. Also, because some of these liver cells are viable, because not all of the liver is this fibrin tissue, scar tissue, what we have is some conjugation going on. So remember, it's these nodules that are formed, these ducts that are formed. Um, so the fibrous scar tissue isn't 100% of the liver right away. So therefore, what we get is some of the liver conjugating the bilirubin, making bile, except that there's also channels that are obstructed when it goes from the gallbladder into the duodenum. So what you get then is bilirubin or some of the bile being absorbed into the system that's conjugated. So the point is when a patient has liver cirrhosis, they're going to have both conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin that's elevated. So we're gonna compare that when we look at something like cholecystitis, where all of the bilirubin that's elevated is going to be conjugated because the liver's fine and we're just referring to the gallbladder. So we'll just tuck that away for, for a later discussion and also for our discussion of the labs. 
let's look at another function of the liver, again, and it's related to the metabolism of bilirubin, but just the actual formation of bile and then the secretion of bile into the duodenum, which is necessary for digestion of our foods, emulsification of fats, absorption of fats, and fat-soluble vitamins. So when the liver fails and it's not doing that function anymore, you have a patient that's really nauseous, you know, sick to their stomach, they're not able to digest food. And what is a, the dangerous aspect of this is that they are not able to absorb our fat-soluble vitamins, which are what? A, E, D, and K. So without proper formation and secretion of bile, what you have is malabsorption of that fat-soluble vitamin K. And here we have our third reason why patients bleed who are uh, in liver failure. Another function of the liver is called protein degradation. And what happens is that normal protein in our gut that we've consumed, whether it be protein foods or in the case of bleeding varices, that's a protein. And it's acted upon by the normal flora bacteria in the gut. That becomes relevant when we talk about intervention. So understanding the pathophysiology is so helpful to understanding clinical manifestations and also the approaches to treat. So because normal flora bacteria acts upon the protein in the gut, this protein degradation has the byproduct of NH3 or ammonia. Normally, in normal physiology, the liver has the job of transforming that NH3 ammonia into that excretable form of blood, urea, and nitrogen. Well, when the liver fails, what we have is elevation of circulating ammonia in the system. Now, the problem with this NH3 not being excreted or transformed first is that it crosses the blood-brain barrier and causes all kinds of neurologic problems. Everything from slight confusion to belligerence, combativeness, certainly change in personality, sometimes somnolence and sleepiness. So level of consciousness is greatly affected. Something else that happens with hepatic encephalopathy that you can uh, use uh, to assess hepatic encephalopathy is that the patient has what's called asterixis, which is a flapping tremor of the hand that occurs as a result of these elevated ammonia levels. The liver is also responsible to inactivate circulating hormones. So circulating hormones like aldosterone, which is responsible for water balance in the system as that end hormone released in the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone system. Uh, also responsible to inactivate circulating estrogen in the male and circulating testosterone in the female. Well, when the liver fails, what we have is elevated levels of aldosterone. Well, if we have elevated levels of aldosterone, we're gonna to continue to reabsorb sodium, continue to reabsorb water, and that's gonna result in fluid volume overload. And because we're hypoalbuminemic, where's that volume and that fluid gonna go? It's gonna go into the tissues, into that third space that we're calling it, into the lungs. The patient has pretty severe fluid volume overload. In addition, in the male that does not inactivate this circulating estrogen, we're gonna have problems with something called pectoral alopecia, which is the, the loss of hair on the chest that normally would be there something called palmar erythema, which is not a dangerous finding, but it's an assessment that indicates that certainly the liver is not doing its job of inactivating what it normally does. So palmar erythema is a result of elevated estrogen levels, kind of a, a dilated capillary of the palms occurs. Also in the male, things like gynecomastia or breasts, in the female, you also get things like the receding hairline that would be normal in a male, but in females with elevated uh, testosterone levels, that you know would be something pathophysiologic.